Amen. What a blessing. Wasn't that good? I like it when the cup runs over and the saucer gets a little. I like that. Amen. Well, it's good to be in church tonight. I have enjoyed being here. What a joy and an honor it is to be back at the Trinity Baptist Church. And I appreciate uh, Pastor uh, Lassiter allowing me to come and to uh, be here and a part of this great uh, Southwest Conference uh, this year. And it's good to see many uh, preachers and friends. And some I haven't seen in a while. It sure is good to see you again. And, of course, it's good to see my good friend, Dr. Bob Smith. And I sure appreciate him uh, so very much. And I pray for he and his wife. And I thank the Lord for uh, their testimony and their influence in my life personally. And I sure thank God for them and thank God for this church, at Trinity Baptist Church. I enjoyed the preaching tonight already. I, 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 don't want to, I don't want to run a while and then fail. I want to finish well. I really do. I pray and pray. Oh, God, help me finish well. But it'll take more than faith to finish well. It'll take those seven things added to our faith, won't it? Sometimes faith is not enough. It takes more than that. It takes those seven things added to, uh, to our faith. And I like Bible preaching. And that was a great blessing. I sure enjoy these fellas, and I enjoy their singing as well. I enjoy the music. I enjoy uh, them. I enjoy good spirit. I like that. I I don't like to go to church where it looks like folks have been sentenced and they're on weekend incarceration. Uh, I I like it when folks have a little fun. And a preacher was out visiting his absentees one time, and he said to a fellow, he said, you've not been in church in a while. Well, he said, preacher, it's just been raining and raining and raining. Yeah, he said, I know, but he said, it's always dry at the church. He said, yeah, that's another reason I've not been coming. He said, it's always dry at the church, and I'm glad it's not dry tonight. Amen? It's not dry. It's good. It's good. I like it. I, I, if, I don't, if I didn't have fun at church, I wouldn't get to have any fun. Uh, a fellow asked me last week, he said, preacher, what's your hobby? I said, preaching. And uh, I just go to church every night, it seems like, and I enjoy it. I'm glad. I started going nine months before I was born. And I haven't burned out yet. And I mean that. I, I haven't. Got saved when I was five. First airplane ride was with Lester Roloff. I got saved when I was five. I got the assurance of my salvation when I flew with Lester Roloff. And uh, I know I'm saved. I know that I know I'm saved. There's several tables back there with good material on them. I want to mention a couple of things that are on my table. Uh, this is a booklet for those that you may want to encourage to get into the bus ministry. I believe the bus ministry is still uh, the greatest uh, harvesting of souls, the greatest tool that we can use. Uh, yesterday we ran 24 buses and picked up a little over 1,100 young people, and we have for the last several weeks averaged over 1,100 on buses. And that's not the miracle, 1,100 coming to church. The miracle is getting all 1,100 back to the same address that you picked them up from. And uh, But anyway, if you have someone that's new to the bus ministry or you want to introduce them to the bus ministry, uh, that booklet is there. And then I'm writing a series of books on church growth, and this is called Church Growth Through the Bus Ministry. I chose to write the book first. I'm talking to a lot of preachers. They say, well, I'm going to get my feet on the ground before I start a bus ministry. And I tell them, well, start a van ministry, an empty seat ministry. If you don't go get sinners, you never will get your feet on the ground. Uh, you better go get somebody and get them to church. And, uh, and so anyway, that book, uh, Church Growth Through the Bus Ministry, this book I just got three weeks ago. It's called Church Growth Principles and Practices, and there are five divisions uh, in the book, the philosophy of church growth, the principles of church growth, the pastor in church growth, the people of church growth, and the programs of a growing church. And uh, those are available. I believe these books are $18 each. You can have both of them together for $25. And then this book is uh, $2 right here. Luke chapter 18 tonight. Uh, Luke chapter 18, if you'll stand with me. Uh, Luke chapter 18, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And it's in verse number 1 that we find the truth. And then uh, we find the parable to illustrate the truth. And then we find a very powerful uh, statement uh, by way of a question at the end of the passage, and that's in uh, verse number 8. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, and here it is, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. 
And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? I'm going to preach tonight on the subject, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd stir our hearts tonight in this matter of faith in you. Lord, sometimes we talk about faith in you, but we don't behave uh, the way we talk. Lord, we don't act as though we have faith. We act as though we've given up. And Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry tonight that I have many preacher brethren that are somewhat discouraged. And Lord, I know we're living in the last days, but the final lap shouldn't be a depressing one. It ought to be the most exciting lap of the race, for Lord, we're soon to come home. And I pray that you'd help us as we run. And Lord, as we live in these days, we would give it all we've got. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Please, speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, you promised. Uh, Lord, uh, you said that you'd give your spirit to them that ask him. I ask you again. I ask that you'd fill me again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. There are two people in this parable. The first is an unjust judge. Now, this judge has no concern with what the law is, with what right is, with what wrong is. He has this position so he can take bribes and make money. And the Bible says two things about this judge, that he feareth not God... And he has no regard for man. So it doesn't matter if you tell him that you're going to pray for him. It's not going to affect him. He has no fear of God. It does not matter if you say to this judge, here's what God said or here's what the Bible says. It's not going to affect the judge because he has no fear. He has no respect of God. In addition to that, he has no regard for man. So it doesn't matter to him if you're hurting. It doesn't matter to him if someone is taking advantage of you. What he's looking for in the courtroom is who he can get the most money out of. That's a pretty tough situation to be in in court. And then we have a widow woman. Uh, We have a woman that is in the worst of all circumstances and she has an adversary and she goes to the judge and she asks the judge to avenge her of her adversary, but he would not. She had nothing to give. She had no money to give him. She had no bribes. There was no profit in him avenging her, uh, but because she would not stop asking And because she asked again and again and again and again, and not because he feared God or cared anything about the woman, the Bible says that he did answer her request and he did avenge her of her adversary. Now, if you look at the context of this passage of Scripture, it really helps to bring to light what's going on in this chapter and it helps us to understand and apply it to the day in which we live. The context of chapter 18 is chapter 17. In the last part of the chapter, Jesus is teaching his disciples about the last days. He's telling them what's going to happen in the days before uh, the return of Christ. He tells them of the tribulation and the difficulty they're going to face. Uh, You'll find in chapter 17 and verse number uh, 26, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And then he says in verse number 28, Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, uh, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And Jesus is telling them and preparing them uh, for the last days. And telling them it's going to be, uh, there's going to be some difficulties and things are not going uh, uh, to be fair. And in fact, I believe this uh, uh, parable could be applied uh, in this way and that it represents God's people in a world that has no regard for God, helpless against the rules and regulations of secular man, disrespected because we are people of faith in God's Word and under the attack of the adversary. However, he said, men ought always to pray and not to faint because there is a judge 
that is above the throne of this judge. And he's still on the throne. And his throne and his authority has never been threatened. And it will not change. And even though you come to the very last day of life and ministry, men ought always to pray and not to faint. You say, how in the world do we minister in an unfair world? Uh, we pray and we don't faint. How, 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 do, how do we get things done when there seem to be so many regulations and so many things against us just because, I mean, if you announce that you're a Christian, you're in trouble already. You have seen the news, no doubt, and it's been on all the national news channels. Uh, we had uh, 57 clerks. The news said three County clerks. There were 57 that I was with at the Capitol building outside the governor's office that petitioned him to change the marriage license in the state of Kentucky one more time. He changed the license seven times to accommodate same-sex marriage after the June ruling of the Supreme Court. And they asked him, would you make one more change? Would you change the marriage license so that the person who performs the ceremony would solemnize the certificate with their signature rather than making the clerks sign the signatures to solemnize the marriage. That's not even how Fox News said it. You just heard there was a woman that wouldn't keep the law and she went to jail because she was a lawbreaker. That's not true. Not true at all. It's the furthest thing from the truth. And they simply asked, they said, we'll give the license, we'll file the license, uh, we file uh, 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 property uh, uh, certificates, we file all kinds of papers, we have a problem fi filing them, we're not going to solemnize a marriage between a same-sex couple. There were three county clerks that made public statements that they would not issue a license, and there was one county clerk that the ACLU found uh, the federal judge to be a liberal judge, uh, one that feared not God and cared not for man. And they took this woman, a Christian woman. Why, well, you say, I heard she'd been married three times. She had. And she lived a wicked life. And her mother-in-law said, Kim, I want you to go to... I want you to go to jail with me before I, I... I mean, I want you to go to a church with me before I die. Kim said, I don't want to go to church. She said, I, I, that's my dying request that you go to church. Kim Davis went to church and she got born again that night. I mean, God saved her, God changed her. And she said this, she said, if that God would die for me and pay for my wicked sins, then I'm going to live for Him the rest of my life. And so the ACLU has made up all kinds of, of uh, accusations and false accusations. And they said to her, you have to issue the license. She said, I will, but I won't sign the license. I won't sign them. They said, if you don't, we'll put you in jail. On August 22nd, I put together a rally at the state capitol. I worked to get 2,500 people to come and show support for her and the other clerks. 10,000 people showed up to show support for her. She stood before the judge, and the judge said, Are you going to issue the license? She said, I cannot sign the license. You know what he did? He had her handcuffed. Not only handcuffed, he had her shackled. He had chains put around her waist and around her feet, and they let her off to jail. She spent five days and five nights there. You may have seen a picture of her husband, Joey, sort of dressed up when he found out CNN was coming. He's a fellow with the overalls on. They couldn't get him to talk or say anything. I love what he said when he did speak. He said, now, Kim, my wife there, he said, she's a believer in that First Amendment. He said, that second one's my favorite. The Attorney General of the state of Kentucky, you see, 75% of Kentuckians, we passed a constitutional amendment, amendment to our state constitution that said marriage is between a man and a woman. 1.22 million people passed that law. But you see, we live in a day where there are judges that have no fear of God and have no regard of man. So what do we do? It sounds like a day to faint. Jesus said, I don't want you to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. 
I want you to understand there is a judge and God is not comparing this wicked judge to him. He's contrasting or showing the difference. He's the opposite of what our God is. And I want to tell you something tonight. Our God is still on the throne. We are on the winning side. We cannot faint. We must give it all we've got. Jesus is coming soon. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. I want to give you five statements tonight why you and I must continue to pray and not to faint. By the way, the word pray, I believe, if you look at all of the verses together, is an indication of more than just our time spent with God in prayer. But he uses the word prayer in verse number 1. And then in verse number 8, he says, Shall he find faith on the earth? Those are folks that are still claiming and practicing the promises of God. Now, if I knew Jesus was coming Friday night, I want to give it all of God until he comes. When he comes, as the preacher said, I want him to find me busy. I want him to find me uh, knocking on doors. I want him to find me preaching. I want him, fi- want him to find me running full stride. I don't want to be a person that has fainted because of the adversary. I want always to pray and not to faint. Five statements I'll give them to you quickly. First of all, we can't stop praying. There's too much at stake. There's too much at stake. He spake a parable and said that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now think, what if this woman had given up in her praying? She would have continued to suffer at the hand of her adversary. But she wouldn't quit. She wouldn't faint. She kept praying. She kept going. Now if you give up, somebody in your town is going to die and go to hell. If you stop praying, your buses are going to stop running. If you stop praying, your classes are going to dwindle. Somebody's got to have faith in God to understand that the circumstances do not affect God. God affects the circumstances. And men ought always to pray and not to faint. Starting in the sixth grade, my dad gave to me ten months out of the year a biography to read every month. Ten months out of the year. I read biographies of preachers. I read uh, the, uh, the smaller version of the Fox's Book of Martyrs and later the larger version. One of the biographies my dad gave to me was the biography of George Mueller. I loved the story. I loved and it impressed me in the matter of prayer. George Mueller was a man of prayer. You know the story. It is said of George Mueller that started the orphanage uh, work there uh, that uh, there were times he had no food to eat, but he sat the children down and they thanked God for the food they didn't even have. Some kind of a food delivery truck or wagon would break down outside the orphanage and they would knock on the door and say, Mr. Mueller, could you use this milk? Could you use this food? They said it was a dangerous thing to drive past that orphanage if you had something on your truck that George Mueller needed because he'd tell God and God would break you down you'd have to give it to him. But you know the thing that impressed me most about George Mueller's prayer life? Now that's quite impressive to, act, to thank God for food you don't have and by the time you finish praying, food is being put on the table. That's pretty impressive. But you know what impressed me about the prayer life of George Mueller? It wasn't the fact that God answered uh, prayers for him immediately. There were some prayers that God didn't answer for George Mueller many, many years. Two of his teenage friends, when he gave his life to Christ, they did not. They did not trust Christ as Savior, and George Mueller prayed for them. He prayed for those two friends for 60 years before they got saved. And one of the last times George Mueller preached, one of his friends that he'd prayed for for 60 years, walked the aisle and trusted Christ as his Savior. God, give us some men today who'll pray and not faint. I remember my dad carried a shirt pocket New Testament. I have that New Testament in my desk drawer at home. And my dad witnessed to someone, he would write their name. If they didn't get saved, he'd write their name down in that testament. There was two ways you could get your name marked out of that testament. You could die or get saved. He didn't witness to you if you didn't get saved. Sorry about your luck going to the next one. Boy, he stayed after you. He prayed for you. We are living in a day when there's opposition. It's not an easy thing to serve God. You don't find a whole lot of help at City Hall. Uh, We might find some lip service here and there. and And then again, there are some folks that are Christians, and I thank God for them. But the truth is, uh, this world's organized against us. 
You drive through the old part of town, you'll find the main street corner uh, had a church on the corner because they built the church first and the community, community around it. Now they don't want a church in the community at all. What are we going to do? Men ought always to pray and not to faint. There's too much at stake for you, for you and I to stop praying. I want to say number two, we can't permit circumstances to stop our praying. We, can't, uh, we cannot uh, uh, permit circumstances to stop our praying. Notice the Bible says in verse number three that this woman is a widow woman. A widow had little standing before the law. The reason she had little standing is because she didn't have any money. And the judges didn't judge because of what was right or wrong. They judged for what money they could get, and she had little to no standing in the court. Her circumstances are the worst you can get. Isaiah spoke much about crooked judges. He said in Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 17, learn to do well. He's giving instruction. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. But later in the chapter, Isaiah said, Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. They don't even want to hear it. That's where this woman was. Her situation was hopeless. Her situation was helpless. She had no standing. Her circumstances couldn't be worse. And can I tell you, it's a little frustrating to me to preach in churches and oftentimes uh, small churches across the country and the preacher begins to apologize because his church is small. Now, I don't want our churches to become small, but whatever size church you have, thank God for it. If you're a man of God called to preach, then, friend, you have a standing with God and you ought to love those people and you ought to shepherd those people. Now, you ought to work to win some more to Christ. And as you work to win more, you ought to work to win more. But I'm saying uh, this mega church mentality has got us to the place that we think we're nothing or we're nobody. Can I tell you something? God didn't use uh, John the Baptist as an example here. He didn't use Elijah as example. He used the person with the worst cir- circumstances of, of, of all, uh, the widow woman. And he says to you and I, she didn't give up. And if she didn't give up, we ought always to pray. We ought always to pray and not to faint. Her situation was bad. Her circumstances were bad. Hey, uh, young men, young ladies in college, you have a standing with God, learn to pray. I remember when we had folding chairs in our church. I was a teenager. And uh, my dad said, we're going to put pews in the church. And we voted for it. And after we voted for it, folks asked what in the world that was. And we found out what it was. And, and uh, we decided to put pews in the church. And my dad said, I'll tell you what let's do. He said, uh, uh, these pews will be $350 a piece. Why don't we get folks to buy a pew and we'll put your name on the end of it? And so folks began to raise their hand. I'll buy one. I'll buy one. I was on this side. The organ in our church was on this side, and I played the organ then, or that day I did. I played either the organ or the piano in church, and, and I raised my hand. My dad stopped while he was taking names. He said, yes, son, what do you want? I said, I want to buy a pew. He said, you got $350? I said, no, but I'd been to one of them conferences and heard that you just prayed. I like what Dr. Jorgensen says about it. He said, every time I pray for money, God gives me a job. And I figured if it worked for uh, Jack Hiles, it worked for Tom Williams, it worked for John Rice, I figured it worked for me. So I said, I'm going to buy one. After church, a lady said to me in front, she said, honey, do you have $350? I said, no, ma'am, not yet. She gave me a $50 bill. I said, glory to God, this is working already. (laughs) And this is the truth. Later, in the back of the church, after that, a lady asked me, she said, you have $350 to buy a pew? I said, no, I got $50. She gave me $50. (laughs) My name's still on the end of one of those pews. I worked out the other $250. I'm saying, you say, but my circumstances are bad. Men are always to pray and not to faint. I give the third reason. We cannot stop praying. The answer may be close. 
Notice what the Bible says in verse number 4. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said, now notice the next two words, within himself. He didn't tell anybody else. He didn't tell his wife. He didn't tell the courtroom. He didn't tell, tell the court clerk. He didn't tell the bailiff. He didn't tell anybody. He just said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this woman troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. You know what he said? The next time that woman comes, I'm going to get rid of her. I'm going to answer her request because she's wearing me out. I'm tired of it the next time she comes. But she didn't know it. They walk into court. Bailiff steps in. All rise. Everybody stands. Judge walks in. Clerks are ready. Here comes the widow woman. Oh, brother. And the judge is thinking, I'm getting rid of her. So she asked. I'm saying yes. I wonder how close you are. I wonder how close you are. I wonder. I thank God today that two weeks ago God answered a prayer. I have prayed earnestly. I mean prayer and fasting for five long years. There have been times I have been sick to my stomach. I've been praying and praying and God answered that prayer just two weeks ago. I wonder how close the answer is. Sometimes we're so close to success and we stop. You know, I'd rather struggle and fail in the will of God than to quit and fall out of the will of God. I was reading John Wesley's diary. And I copied this out of John Wesley's diary. Here's what it said. Sunday morning, May 5th, I preached at St. Anne's Church. I was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday p.m., May 5th, I preached at St. John's Church. Deacon said, and I quote, get out and stay out. Sunday morning, May 12th, preached at St. Jude's Church. Here's what he wrote in his diary. Can't go back there either. Sunday p.m., May 12th, preached at St. George's, kicked out again. Sunday morning, May 19th, I preached. The deacons called a special meeting and said I could not return. Sunday p.m., May 19th, preached on the street. I was kicked off the street. John Wesley's diary said, Sunday morning, May 26, I preached in the meadow. I was chased out of the meadow as a bull was turned loose during the services. <laughs> Sunday morning, June 2nd, I preached out at the edge of town. I was kicked off the highway. Sunday afternoon, June 2nd, I preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came to hear me preach. We've started a little over 30 churches. One of those preacher boys called last week. He said, Preacher, what do you do if you've gone soul winning, visiting, you've had church six months and nobody comes? I said, we covered that in class. I said, what are we supposed to do? He said, yes, sir. He said, I'll go soul winning again this week. I'll prepare my sermon, and I'll go again. Kevin Wynn preached a year, and nobody came. He slept in an old van. Didn't have a decent place to sleep. God used him in a great way. You know why? Because he kept on going. And the Bible says men ought always to pray and not to faint. Let me say the fourth thing. We can't stop praying God's working whether you see it or not. Verse number 7, And shall not God avenge His own elect, which cry day and night unto Him, though He bear long with Him? I tell you, He will avenge them speedily. Now, it doesn't say He will answer speedily. But I'm going to tell you, when He works, He works fast. <laughs> 9-11 from 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock that night. Everybody's attention was heavenward. 
The baseball stadiums were dark. The ball gloves lay in the, uh, lay in the dugout with the ball in the mitt and everybody wondering if we'd ever play baseball again. God had America's attention in just a few hours and God can do it again tonight. And I want to tell you something. When He comes, friend, He's going to come and He's going to avenge us of our adversaries speedily. I'm on the winning side. Men ought always to pray and ought always to pray and not to faint. Can I tell you, God's working even when you don't know He's working? Read the questions Joseph asked from prison. God never answered those. Job asked questions God never answered. On the cross, Jesus asked questions the Father never answered. But in His silence... As his father turned his back, in his silence the sins of mankind was placed on his son. Don't tell me God's not working if he's not speaking. We want him to speak, but in his silence he can do more in his silence than he can. Hey, he, my sins were paid for in his silence. It pleased the father to bruise the son. Roger Sims finished his tour of duty in the army, received an honorable discharge, and was hitchhiking his way home. It was May 7. It was a common scene to see soldiers hitchhiking home after their time of service. He was making his way north through Indiana. He was carrying a heavy suitcase and his cars would go by and hold out his thumb and try to hitch a ride. As he told the stories, cars passed by, and one time he stopped, tired, and he saw a big black Cadillac coming up the highway, and he thought, they won't stop. But anyway, he put his thumb out and turned around and started walking. To his surprise, that big Cadillac pulled over. He walked up to the wind. He said, uh, you headed home, soldier? He said, I sure am. He said, well, if you're going to Chicago, you're in luck. Get in, I'll give you a ride. He said, I'm not going all the way to Chicago, but just this side of Chicago. He said, well, I'll give you a ride to there. He said, by the way, my name is Mr. Hanover. I own a business in Chicago. I'm on my way back home. He said, are you going home for the final time, soldier? He said, yes, sir, I am. Take the uniform off when I get home. I look forward to it. Roger was a Christian. And the first thing that came to Roger's mind was, well, you know what it was. You're supposed to find out if the man you're talking to you just met is a Christian or not. But Roger was tired of walking. He didn't want to be put out, didn't want to make this man mad, but finally he prayed and he got up the nerve. He said, Mr. Hanover, are you a Christian? He said, no, Roger, I'm not. Well, he said, let me tell you how I became a Christian. He gave him the gospel. When Roger finished, the man pulled the car over, and as he later told the story, he thought he was going to put him out of his car. But he put his hands on the steering wheel, laid his head in his arms, and he prayed and received Christ as his personal Savior. Roger rejoiced. The only regret he had is he hadn't told him 75 miles before how to be saved. He got to his exit or place to get off, and he told Mr. Hanover, this is where I'll get off here. And he did, and they said goodbye. Mr. Hanover went on his way. Roger went home. It's five years later. Roger has his own business. He has two children now and a family. And his business is taking him to Chicago. He said to his wife, he said, I'm going to go see Mr. Hanover, the fellow I told you about that gave me a ride the day I got out of the Army. I'm going to go see how he's doing. He found his business card, and he found his way to Chicago to the business address, and my, what a business it was. He walked in, he said to the receptionist, he said, uh, uh, My name is Roger Sims, could I see Mr. Hanover? The The receptionist said, That wouldn't be possible, but you could see Mrs. Hanover if you'd like. He said, That would be good. They took him into a very nice executive office. In just a moment, a lady about 55 to 60 years of age, she came and she said, Hello, I'm Mr. Hanover. I'm Mrs. Hanover. 
He said, my name is Roger Sims. I got out of the army a few years ago and I was just hitchhiking home. Your husband gave me a ride and and I just wanted to come see how he was doing. She said, Roger, what did you talk about when you were coming home that day? Well, again, he thought, I need to witness to this lady, but he thought, I don't know if I should or not, but we always should. He said, well, ma'am, I do remember. I told your husband I was a Christian, and I told him how he could be saved, and he pulled over beside the road and prayed the sinner's prayer and received Christ as his Savior. With that, she began to weep. She said, Roger, do you know what day it was? He said, I know exactly what day it was. It was May 7. Ma'am, is there something wrong? She said, Roger, my husband was killed in an automobile accident May 7th, just a few miles from home. Roger, for five years I've been bitter at God. I've stopped going to church. I had no idea my husband got saved just a short while before he died. Can I tell you something tonight? God doesn't work for me. I work for Him. That means God doesn't have to report to me. God gives the orders and I'm just supposed to pray and not faint. I'm just supposed to witness and not faint. I'm just supposed to give the gospel track and not faint. I'm just supposed to preach the sermon and not faint. I'm suppo- We'll find out when we get to heaven. But I want to tell you something tonight. You and I are on the winning side, and we need not allow the difficulties and the unjust judge that has no fear of God and no regard for man. Let you and I do what we're supposed to do until Jesus comes. The fifth thing, and I'm finished, we cannot give up on his promise. He said in verse number 8, Shall he find faith on the earth? What does that mean? When Jesus comes, will there be those who still believe that the gospel works? Jesus said to the four men who carried the man on the bed, when he saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. They can't put their faith in God until you and I have enough faith in God to say, if I go get them and I get them to Jesus and I get them to the gospel, something's going to happen. The problem is not that the world has lost its faith. The problem is that the child of God does. I was preaching in southern Florida. preacher said to me, he said, so winning doesn't work here anymore. And I said, so? So? I said, you're not going to quit, are you? I said, it doesn't say go as long as it works. He just said go. The rest of the story you could figure out easy. In three months he was gone. But thank God, six months later, a preacher went that believed in soul winning. When I went there to preach, he said, you know, the strangest thing happens. He said, I go soul winning. I'll knock on a hundred doors. Not a single one of those people will come. And I'll come to church and be five or six visitors there. You know why it's that way? Because we'll get to thinking it's us. You got nothing to do with us except just our obedience and faith in Him. I want to say tonight, men ought always to pray. And not to faint. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Sometimes we get discouraged. We do. I do. Lord, there have been times in the past five years as I prayed so hard, I just didn't know. I just kept hitting a wall. But I couldn't get this passage of Scripture out of my mind. I just couldn't get it out. Sometimes I prayed in faith. Sometimes I prayed in doubt. But I tried to just keep on praying. And I pray that you'd help those tonight. They've given up praying for a loved one. They've given up praying for a bus route. They've given up praying for an answer to prayer. They've given up praying for provision. I pray that you'd help us tonight to heed the admonition that says men ought always to pray and not to faint.